on the bus. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. Good morning and welcome to um, the first of. Could we, could we have the final few people who are planning to come in? Could they, could they come in and then we maybe close the door? If there are any, any people out there who are planning to come in, could I encourage them to come in and so we can start? Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first <coughs> uh, panel discussion on the second day of the Bled Strategic Forum. Um, I'd like to thank you all for coming, and I'd like uh, particularly to thank uh, the very uh, esteemed and expert selection of speakers we have this morning. I'm very much looking forward to hearing uh, people's contributions and, people's, uh, and, and the subsequent debate. Um, just a quick word. We're on a very tight time schedule, as you've seen. There are a large number of speakers. So I'm going to try and be as brief as possible. Uh, just a quick word. My name is Simon Taylor, and I'm the senior political reporter of European Voice newspaper in Brussels. Um, the title of this session is From Bali to Copenhagen, Tackling Climate Change with Renewable Solutions. Um, we know the European Union ha has assumed leadership on climate change and has already agreed uh, the 2020 targets that I'm sure you're very familiar with. Uh, those targets exist whether or not there's an international agreement. Obviously, if in the absence of an international agreement uh, on a follow-up to the Kyoto Protocol next year, it'll be very difficult, but the European Union is committed. Um, so that means we have to start looking very seriously now at how we achieve those targets. Um, and as you know, the, uh, the Commission's climate change and energy package uh, is a very broad-ranging uh, package of legislation looking at the different areas in which we might achieve these. Um, I'd like to be very focused this morning uh, and I would uh, in that case um, urge the speakers to maybe address a couple of questions. Uh, the first question is which technology or combination of technologies do you feel has the greatest potential to help the European Union and the international community achieve its climate change targets? There are a range of technologies, there are different preferences, different energy mixes, which for you is the most promising, and how should we pay for them? Wh whichever solution you look at, we are talking at billions, if not trillions, of investment, whether it's in, uh, whether it's in carbon capture and storage, whether it's in new uh, interconnection, whether it's in new uh, LN LNG uh, reception ports. Every solution we look at will cost uh, the taxpayer or the consumer uh, uh, billions, if not trillions of dollars. So how are we going to pay for this and who should pay for it? Is it a government priority? Should it be, um, should it be an area of public spending like health and social, uh, social expenditure? Or should we look to the companies who are doing very well? Uh, Hans probably from Shell won't appreciate me saying this, but uh, there's a discussion constantly about windfall taxes. Is that a good way to raise the revenue that we need? Or um, can we finance it from uh, emissions trading uh, auctions? So those are the questions I'd like to focus on. I'll give a very brief introduction from each speaker. We have uh, about uh, an hour and 20 minutes for the initial presentations. I'm sorry that it means everyone has to uh, be very brief, uh, but hopefully we can have a distillation of people's views. And then we have uh, around 45 minutes for a real exchange and debate, uh, which I think is really the value of such panels. So again, thank you for all for attending, and thank you to our panellists. Uh, we will start with uh, His Excellency Mr. Jan Kubisch, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Slovak Republic. Mr. Kubisch. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm really flattered that you said that you have a, a panel of eminent experts on uh, the issues of energy uh, that would be able to give you views and opinions on technical solutions. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm not in that category then. As Foreign Minister, I, I should understand a little bit of everything, but definitely I'm not an expert. Nevertheless, uh, indeed, uh, uh, your questions are uh, hitting uh, a lot of good targets. Uh, yesterday we had a good opening panel, and I believe that uh, many things uh, uh, said there are providing a frame for our activities as well. As far as Slovakia is concerned, uh, I have uh, distributed or will distribute my statement, so you will find uh, some concrete elements about our approach uh, there. I will not repeat it, but one of the questions is... Uh, Indeed, uh, 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 what are the sources? And I would like for my country 
to echo the words of uh, Prime Minister of the Czech Republic, Topolánek, when he was speaking about nuclear energy and mix. And definitely for my country, and not only for my country, nuclear energy is one of the sources uh, 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 that is preferred. Uh, and uh, we will develop it uh, 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 as a part of our energy mix, uh, as a part uh, of our contribution to the new uh, uh, energy uh, independence, uh, uh, not all Turkey, but independence, in a way, uh, of my country in the future, because I believe this is one of the objectives at least uh, my government uh, uh, would like to achieve. Uh, another point that I would like to highlight from yesterday's discussion is uh, uh, that energy security at this point of time and most likely for the foreseeable future is a matter uh, that is very close to geopolitical understanding of security, that it's not simply technical. And why it is so? Because when we speak about energy security, we still speak mostly about hydrocarbons, not about renewable sources of energy, but about hydrocarbons. And in so far as we will be speaking about hydrocarbons as the main uh, source of energy, uh, we will always speak in the terms of geopolitical energy security. So it's not freedom. And that's why it is so important to think also about what, are, what is the environment that is conducive to solving our problems with our own energy security. Again, yesterday in our panel, another panel on Georgia, we touched upon one of the questions. Uh, this is indeed how we solve problems and crises in problematic areas that are, be it producers, uh, uh, areas of producers of energy uh, uh, resources, hydrocarbon resources, or transit countries. Georgia is one of the examples, but from that perspective, I believe uh, it is crucial to pay more attention to the problems of Iran and Iraq. Without solving these situations, and of course broader Middle East, we would not be able to achieve energy security in the fullest sense possible. So again, it is so imperative to, for example, address uh, the issue of relations between Iran and the neighboring countries, Iran and the international community, Iran and the United States. And it means when we speak about energy security, we speak about Iran nuclear program and what to do with this, how to solve this issue to enable us then to speak from strategic perspective about, for example, European Union energy security. Many words were said yesterday as well about uh, the fate of Nabucco project. Many are saying that this is a dead end. I don't think so, because I believe that in the foreseeable future, one year, one and a half, we should, we will, we should have a solution of the Iran nuclear program. And that would, that would open the doors to energy security and to cooperation and to projects like Nabucco. That's at least my reading. Another element that I would like to add, uh, again from this uh, more foreign minister's perspective than anything else, is the question how to shape relations between two, three distinct group of countries. Of course, many of them are in uh, all three positions, but not all of them. Producer countries, transit countries, and consumer countries. And again yesterday, it was said that we should think about issues how to create uh, perhaps uh, and, and uh, negotiate a pact between consumer countries and producer countries. It was mentioned there it might be a good idea to have an understanding on the side of both producer and consumer countries uh, uh, how much will be consumed in, in the whole region of the EU or individual countries in the coming period of 15 years, etc., etc., what might be the prices, etc. So, I'm not sure whether this is the way, but at least this is one of the areas worth exploring. Transit countries, that's another category, and again from the perspective of hydrocarbons and European Union, and it means hydrocarbons that are coming with the assistance of the Russian Federation, if not directly from the Russian Federation, uh, we need to think about that because transit countries are organizing themselves. And of course, very soon we will see the impact of such an organization of transit countries. Ukraine, first of all, is a very prominent 
leader in this. So when speaking about energy security and European Union, we should not forget that element. Coming back uh, again uh, to one of the points mentioned yesterday, in spite of the fact that uh, uh, because of the situation in Georgia, many countries are thinking about relations between the European Union and Russia and how to shape them in the future, uh, we should not forget that when speaking about energy, energy security, energy uh, uh, consumption and sources of energy, the Russian Federation is and will remain a partner of the European Union. And we have to have this in mind. Now, I'm not speaking only about my country, but you know the figures about the European Union. Yes, it's interdependence, uh, uh, but it will not disappear only because of some problems that we have and will have uh, in our relations. So these are just a couple of points. One last point. Uh, I uh, last week uh, uh, spent some time in the United States uh, and uh, witnessed part of the Democratic uh, Convention there and different meetings around. I uh, uh, was struck by uh, so many speakers uh, in the Democratic Convention uh, that were mentioning that we should get rid of our reliance on insecure regions or dubious countries as sources of hydrocarbons. I don't know whether it's the prevailing mood uh, uh, there. I am not sure who will be the winner. It's none of our business. It's for the United States and people of the United States to decide. Nevertheless, I was struck by such persistent note in almost all of the statements at the Democratic Convention. And another point uh, was mentioned that it is very difficult to fulfill objectives like, for example, prescribed in the Kyoto Protocol for a simple reason. Many leaders of the countries, they know very well what is good for the world, and they know what is good for the environment, and they are keen to reach that. But, of course, in democracies, they are a part of democratic processes. And not always, or even less frequently than desirable, they are able to reach the objectives they are supporting, because the democratic processes in their own countries, decision-making processes, business interests, etc., are preventing them from being 100% successful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Kubis. I'm going to press straight on. I'm very honoured to have um, Mr. Shiam Saran. Uh, who is the Special Envoy of the Indian Prime Minister on Climate Change, Mr. Saran. Thank you, Mr. Taylor. Uh, to begin with, I would like to assure people I will not talk about Georgia. <laughs> uh, we welcome this opportunity to share our views about uh, climate change with this very distinguished uh, panel. And uh, I would like to uh, address the issues that you had mentioned. Uh, in the larger context, which is there in the uh, title of this uh, panel, which is From Bali to Copenhagen, uh, what do we do with the multilateral negotiating process? Because the questions that you have raised cannot really be addressed uh, adequately unless we get the politics right. And the politics is happening in these negotiations. So I think it's very important that we get that negotiating process right. Um, we, we consider the challenge of climate change really as a cross-cutting global issue. This is one of those issues which, even with the best of national intentions and efforts, uh, cannot really be adequately addressed. So we welcome what the European Union is trying to do. Uh, and there are many of us, including India and China, um, amongst the developing countries, who are also doing a great deal on the national level. But unless we have a global approach, and a approach which takes into account the fact that this is a cross-cutting issue. Uh, again, we will not get to where we want to get. Uh, such a global mission uh, requires us to recognize that uh, what we are really facing at this point of time is really an extraordinary challenge. Uh, and uh, this requires, uh, to my mind, if we say it is an extraordinary challenge, then it requires an extraordinary response. <coughs> Uh, while there is talk of climate change being an extraordinary challenge, uh, what we have seen so far, at least my experience of the multilateral negotiations so far, has uh, been that uh, the effort is really should be co called, quote, under ordinary. Uh, we are really not 
uh, coming up with uh, with solutions which really address the extraordinary nature of the challenge that we are facing. Uh, and this extraordinary response cannot be uh, actually delivered by the traditional negotiating process. You know, what is a traditional negotiating process? For example, what we have in trade negotiations. Each one of us goes to the, uh, you know, negotiating table. Uh, we are very clear about what our national interests are, what is the turf that we have to protect. And in the process of dealing with each other, horse trading with each other, we come up with a response. We come up with a solution. But usually that solution is a least common denominator solution. It is not a solution which is uh, the optimal solution. Now, if you are looking at an extraordinary challenge, then you cannot deliver an extraordinary response through the traditional negotiating process. This is, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I'm saying this very frankly, uh, this is what uh, is currently happening in the, in the nego multilateral negotiating process. Uh, so what do we, how, how do we deliver this extraordinary response? Uh, I think the, one of the most important things to remember is that if we are really trying to mobilize a global approach, if we really want to get all the countries on board, first of all, I think the labeling which is going on uh, saying, oh, you know, major emitters, India, China, um, you know, the United States of America saying we will not do anything unless India and China do something, you know, this kind of a finger pointing and labeling is not going to deliver a collaborative approach. If you want a collaborative approach, then it is extremely important to recognize that this collaborative approach in today's world can only be an equitable approach. It has to be seen to be fair by all those who are participating in this process. Yesterday, a uh, reference was made to the fact that, you know, there are 400 million Indians who consider themselves part of a middle class, and the, each one of them aspires to have a car. What will happen to the global climate? Well, you know, there is no way that in a democratic country like India, reference was made to democratic processes, can we go to the people of India, and especially the 400, 500 million Indians who do not have electricity, and say, sorry, you will not be able to have any electricity at all for the rest of your lives because there is a climate change problem. Or that you as middle class should not aspire to a better lifestyle because there is a climate change problem. And then say that as far as the developed countries are concerned, you know, we have achieved a certain lifestyle. Our electorate will not agree to any diminution in these lifestyles or any cut in the living standards. You cannot have an approach which says we get to keep what we have because we got here first. Since you are a latecomer, you have to stay where you are. That will not work. Therefore, we have to try and get an approach which is seen as to be equitable, which is seen to be fair. If that is conceded, then I think we can deliver a collaborative approach. Then let me come to the questions that you raised about technology, about financing. These are critical questions. What we would say is that already today, there are a number of technologies which can actually make a quite a big impact on the climate change issue. You know, there are, there are any number of technologies to improve uh, efficiency, energy efficiency. In India itself, over the last 10 years, 15 years, we have delivered 8 to 9 percent rate of growth with only 4 to 5 percent increase in our energy consumption. So that goes to show that if you put your mind to it, you can actually achieve very, very significant changes in your efficiency levels. Uh, reference was made to Denmark, for example, and I think that's a very good uh, example to follow. Uh, then there are technologies like solar energy, like wind energy. Uh, there are also, um, you know, new new um, advances being made in hydrogen economy. Nuclear energy has been mentioned as a possible clean source of energy. There are any number of technologies like that that, in the short and medium term, can actually deliver significant significant advances if we have a collaborative approach. How do we deliver that collaborative approach? There, are, there is an IPR issue. Unless you have a mechanism whereby some of these technologies which can bring about a major impact on climate change, unless they are put in the public domain, unless they become international public goods and are wide, available for wide diffusion, you will not be able to address this issue. Now, I'm not saying you deprive the innovator of his, of his uh, you know, reward for innovation. But, you know, why not 
all the governments who are represented at the negotiating table. And I think India and China would be ready to put their own contribution in. Let us buy some of these technologies, put them as international public goods, and diffuse them widely. So market will not deliver this. It is, it's important that we uh, understand that market is not capable of delivering this. As far as financing is concerned, again, I think what is very important is the financing should be something which is under the international multilateral process. It cannot be a simple donor-driven process where priorities of the donors come into play. This should be truly multilateral, and there is a mechanism under the UNFCC for the financing mechanism to be located within the multilateral process. If we do that, then I think the kind of financing that we need for these collaborative ventures would also be available. Uh, I think I will stop here, but I think if this is the approach, a very radical change from the approach that we have so far ado adopted, then what we really want to deliver is very revolutionary shift from 200 years of the pattern of industrial development based on carbon to a renewable-based uh, pattern of development. This shift will not come about. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sarah, for a heartfelt and passionate uh, uh, presentation. Our next speaker is Dr. Mita Brissel. Well, sorry for my uh, non existent knowledge of Slovenian. Uh, Mr. Brissel is the State Secretary at the Minister of the Environment, and he's representing his minister, who unfortunately wasn't able to join us today, but I'm sure Mr. Brissel will give us uh, an equally scintillating and stimulating contribution. Thank you, and I will try to be really uh, short. What is, uh, I believe, needed and what is uh, still not adequately addressed, taking into account all what is uh, ahead of us implementing the climate energy package with uh, all, let's say, agreed uh, targets, it's, I believe, um, and this is our experience, to have uh, some sort of commitment, real commitment on the national and transboundary level, um, and to share such, um, let's say, commitment um, with the other regions uh, to uh, somehow reach our uh, needs. By the way, the global uh, crisis or the climate change is, of course, the glo global conflict with really real dimension and we have to act. Now we are here, uh, although the facts are known from at least 1992. The ANSET conference, uh, Rio conference and Ad Agenda 21 was, and it's still perfectly clear, but without any action, without any response. So, uh, this is where we are now. Uh, it's time to act, yes, but how and with what kind of technology or approach? I believe, yeah, it's of course very uh, important uh, to think about the technologies. All technologies are needed. It's at least our uh, perception and combined approach is of course um, the way out. But. Uh, how to get the consensus about the solutions. This is for me or for us, I believe, uh, very essential questions, not just on national level, on transboundary level, because uh, we have to uh, respond. It's not just mitigation, it's very important, the adaptation. The adaptation to, let's say, to prevent floods, to prevent many other disasters very much connected with the negative effect of the climate change. It's also not just floods, but let's say dry periods and the, 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 the droughts and all conflicts with the forest fires and so on. It's not just about the energy production. Uh, we have to also concentrate on uh, the demand side and the organization of our activities uh, on the field in the region. And this is where we think it's definitely time to speak about the new regional approach which is needed and which is transboundary. 
regional uh, dialogue which is uh, for uh, finding solution for first for the regional vision uh, and planning of let's say uh, acceptable uh, solutions and actions on the end of the day also for the new um, uh, infrastructure of for energy supply but to have such a commitment and vision for the regional uh, regional vision we believe it's needed it's must without such regional vision we will fail again uh, and i don't know uh, what is the next step then uh, we can somehow be more efficient uh, for a, to to respond to the global climate change with the uh, let's say regional or organized uh, actions and with the regional vision for the implementation on the end of the day also the the, the uh, energy infrastructure supply uh, and uh, let's say uh, also to supply the, the the demands and this is where we would like to really invest and to somehow get the consensus for the regional action uh, without that it's impossible to, to have a consensus or to build on the end of the day regional or uh, intra-regional structure for the en uh, energy uh, supply. Uh, I'm just going to mention a few. Uh, let's say uh, yesterday we, 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 we uh, had just uh, the very explicit case. Uh, and. Uh, but uh, let's say Slovenia, we are here, we are discussing very much as in, let's say, the time of the Iron Curtain uh, here, but now East Europe, 2008, and climate change package ahead of us, but we are talking still uh, here in Adriatic, as you know, uh, on a very uh, old-fashioned way, where to put the infrastructure for, uh, let's say, uh, gas uh, supply or, and terminals. As it 50 years ago. Is it this Europe? Or let's focus on such regional approach and get the uh, response to that uh, now, here for us and future generation. And this is what we believe that it's possible and that we are responsible. Nobody else. We here are responsible to organize and to, ch to change our attitude to such an approach. And this, uh, let's say, clear bills are important. And really to take seriously, very seriously, local conditions, because if we take it seriously, we can get quite good uh, solutions too. The cases of good practice are based on the local levels. And don't neglect such an, uh, let's say, uh, good uh, maybe po and possible answer uh, for the future and more efficient uh, ex uh, uh, answer uh, to, to our problems uh, again. And this is where we would like really to, to put our finger uh, and this is where we invest very much in the last, uh, let's say, years to improve the dialogue on, on transboundary level for, uh, let's say, sustainable solution also for the energy uh, safety. <laughs> or, um, this is where I believe it's uh, important to, to, to act. Thank you. OK, let's move on to um, Mr Hans-Jürgen Koch, who's Deputy State Secretary from the Danish Ministry of Climate and Energy. Mr Koch, please. Thank you very much. Before I move <coughs> to your questions on which technologies are most promising and who should pay for them, let me make briefly uh, a few points. First, on uh, in, uh, in our perception, it is not possible to continue business as usual, dependent on oil and gas. And uh, let me give you some examples of the Danish experience on how it has been possible to avoid this dependency with the use of energy efficiency and renewable energy and the vision uh, our country has uh, for the future. First on the question on whether to 
to whether it is a, an option to continue business as usual. It is a fact that international organizations, including the International Energy Agency, has 10 years in a row underestimated the development, the increase in oil and natural gas prices. We have now oil, gas, oil prices that are 10 times as high as 10 years ago, seven times as high as seven years ago, and two times as high as one year ago. And nobody can assure us that uh, this uh, will not continue. <coughs> Simultaneously with this, and also as a result of this, uh, international organizations and countries have underestimated the competitiveness of the alternatives to oil and gas, which, for instance, is uh, increased enhanced efforts on energy efficiency and enhanced efforts on deployment of uh, renewable energy. And therefore, it is even more interesting that if you uh, read uh, what the uh, executive director of the IEA, Mr. Tanaka, is stating to newspapers <coughs> in these days, he, has now publicly he is now publicly uh, confirming three facts. Uh, the first fact is that the production of oil from the existing oil fields in the world is decreasing uh, with an average 5% per year. At the, same time, at the same time, the demand is growing with between 1% and 2% per year. That is not a very fortunate development. The second fact is that the oil burden, and that means the ratio between the country's oil bill and its, uh, growth, uh, its GDP, its uh, gross national product, is worse than it was in 1973 and is almost as serious as it was in 1970. Nine, when millions were sent unemployed in the streets of Europe and United States. This is facts that are devastating for the economies of the developing countries, first of all, but also for the economies, the emerging economies, and it is also beginning to have serious impact on the most rich countries in the world, as we can see of the stagnation uh, today. And therefore, the uh, IEA's recommendation is, is interesting to read. Mr. Tanaka has stated recently in a public interview with the German magazine Der Spiegel that the only thing, I quote, the only thing we need to do is consistently to meet the objectives for the CO2 reductions that the rich countries have agreed upon. These are helping not only the climate, but also the energy security, end of quote. This is a clear confirmation of the reconciliation of climate policies with energy policy. It is difficult to imagine that any unbiased and neutral organization could have another view uh, than this one. Let me then turn to what has been done in, in our country and references has been made to that also yesterday when uh, the prime minister of this country made reference to it. And let me therefore take the opportunity to very briefly tell you about it. So what has happened is that since 1980, uh, we have had uh, an economic growth of uh, close to 80, 80%, which is a normal economic growth for highly industrialized countries. At the same time, we, had, we have had no uh, increase in energy consumption. So that demonstrates that it is certainly possible, viable, to decouple uh, economic growth from growth uh, in energy consumption. And then at the same time, we have had a dramatic increase in the, con in, in the contribution from renewable energy. And very briefly on that, uh, the contribution from renewable energy has increased with one percent point, so that starting... Uh, in the last 15 years with close to zero, mm -hmm. and then now we are moving in the last 15 years to having 15% of our total energy consumption covered by renewable energy. And that development will continue until 2020, where we will have 33% of the total energy consumption uh, of the country covered by renewable energy. It is important to remember that the two highest points in Denmark are the two towers carrying the bridge over the Great Belt. So therefore, we have no hydropower to contribute to uh, the renewable 
energy production. So what we are talking about is all of it new renewable energy. Uh, so this, this development has taken place. It demonstrates that even with a country without, a country without specifically good uh, options for renewable energy, it is possible to have a significant contribution from renewable energy. Wind energy alone is today contributing 20% of the total electricity production. Uh, that is the same figure as nuclear power is contributing to electricity production in the United Kingdom and in the United States. It is also important to note that that development has taken place without having any negative effect on the Danish economy. The Danish economy is today, on all indicators, one of the strongest in the European Union. It is also important to note that it has not been strictly necessary uh, from a, a security of supply viewpoint for Denmark to do this because Denmark is also the only net importer of oil and natural gas in the uh, European Union. These experiences have led to that the vision of the Danish government and the Danish parliament today is that Denmark in the long-term future should be 100% independent uh, of uh, fossil fuels. So that means independent of oil, independent of natural gas, but it also means independent of uh, coal. And at the same time, uh, we, you have to remember that of different reasons, hydropower, as I said just before, is not an option in Danish energy supply. And of other political reasons, nuclear power is not an option in Danish energy supply. So therefore, uh, it is based on uh, renewable energy apart from uh, hydropower and energy uh, efficiency. And let me then return to your three questions. Which technologies are the most promising for the future? I would, I would give you three candidates. One, uh, more general energy efficiency technologies are probably the most cost effective. And let me highlight uh, one technology which seems to be a hidden giant, and that is combined heat and power. In our country, we have more than 50% of the electricity production produced by combined heat and power, partly from biomass. And that leads to a fuel efficiency, which is uh, around 90, 90%. Compare that to the average uh, fuel efficiency in coal-fired American power plants, which is around 35%. So that makes a clear difference. Also, other efficiency technologies uh, are very cost-effective. In addition to that, I would mention two of uh, the new renewable technologies, uh, wind energy and uh, biomass. Uh, those are also the two dominant contributors to the Danish energy supply of renewable energy. And these are uh, now very close to be full, fully commercially competitive. At some sites, they are uh, fully commercially competitive with uh, uh, fossil fuels. Um, and let me then say that on carbon capture and storage, this is, of course, a, a very, very important technology for the countries which uh, will have to continue to burn fossil fuels. Uh, the, the problem is that uh, this technology, it is not proven that this technology will work. It is, there's one thing which is certain, and I know that from Norwegian College, which are very keen on carbon capture and storage, it will be extremely expensive, and it will, it will probably not be commercial before at the earliest 2020. And the big problem is to utilize this technology and to make it commercial to prices that can lead to that it is, a, it is an option for India and China. How to pay for renewable and energy efficiency technologies? Uh, the increases in oil prices we have seen, and in natural gas prices and in coal prices, have uh, made it much easier to imagine who should pay for it. 
because the question is more or less that the market should pay for it and can pay for it. When we made uh, a couple of years ago some very bold uh, calculations on how the uh, supply pattern, if the market forces had to decide, would be in Denmark in 2020, if we could count on a price that we thought was extremely high for oil, namely $70, then we found out that wind energy would be far the most competitive supplier, uh, energy supplier for electricity production in the country. The same is the case for biomass, from surplus production, from agriculture, and uh, from uh, forestry. Of course, in the initial phases of introduction of new technologies, as solar, for instance, a very clear example, there is a need for uh, even heavy government subsidies. But in the longer run, if we continue to have the prices at somewhat in the neighborhood of, a, of the level we have now, they, the new technologies will uh, pay for themselves. And if not, uh, the, men, the examples you mentioned, windfall taxes, uh, energy, the emission trade system are good sources for uh, financing. Is it realistic to, uh, to imagine that we can succeed to have this independence of uh, fossil fuels? Our response is that we think it is unrealistic to continue business as usual. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Cox. It's very interesting. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Josep Borrell, who uh, is a former president of the European Parliament, currently president of the Committee on Development. And I just point out, uh, very well qualified to address these issues because he was both uh, budget minister in Spain and environment minister. So if there's someone qualified to talk about our governments to pay, prepared to pay for the price of climate change and environmental protection, I think he's very well qualified. Well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, as chairman of the development committee, I understand very well the, the, the <coughs> questions of our Indian friend. I understand very well how people in developing countries uh, want to have the same degree of, of quality of life that we have thanks to a, a strong energy consumption. The problem is how to do it, because if we have a look at the energy mix, the, the world energy mix today, 79% is carbon energy, 79%. Uh, renewables, it's only 1%. If we take out hydropower and biomass, the others, it's only 1%, <laughs> almost nothing. 30 years from now, or 25 years from now, the prospect says that the carbon energy will still be 81%, two points more. And Renewables will be slightly 2%. So what are we talking about? Renewable, 1% today, 2% 25 years from now. It doesn't seem that we are going to do a big change on the world energy mix. If we go business as usual, something has to be done more than just let the market work. And I think that it, it requires a big political push if we really want to develop renewables, new ables, new capacities, then we have to do something stronger, much stronger. The European Union has proposed to reach 20% of renewables on the year 2020. And this, this evening in Brussels, I will go to vote on the amendments to the directive who says how to reach this objective. Let me say something about the vote we are going to do this, this, this evening, because it's very important for the debate we're doing here. But you know, in the European Union, we are very good at fixing targets. They're very good. Ten years ago, we said, by the year 2010, we will reach 10% of renewables. And we are slightly over 7%. But don't worry. When we are more or less approaching the deadline, and we see that we are very far away from the purpose, from the target, we say, don't worry, we are going to fix another target for a little bit later, and a higher target 10 years later. We are not going to be 10% in 2010, don't worry, we'll be 20% by 2020. Well, it's very good to fix targets. It's much more important to say how are we going to reach them. And there are two things I would like to talk about. 
First, we need to develop big, big projects. And there are four big projects on the table of the European Commission, and we are going to talk about them in the European Parliament. These four big projects is uh, to establish an alliance with the cities and regions to turn buildings into power plant clusters. Each building could become an energy plant. Second, to coordinate an approach to harvest the enormous offshore green and marine energy in the Nordic and Baltic Sea. Third, a master plan for large-scale renovation of the cities of the Central and Eastern Europe, combined with the phasing out of their big biomass potential. And four, a partnership with the Mediterranean countries on energy efficiency and solar thermal electricity and wind power plants. If we were able to develop these big four projects, of course putting public money on it, then we could change this trend. And instead of being 2% 25 years from now, we could do something else. Second, we have to invest much more intelligence, not only money. We need to put much more technical capacity, having much more engineers and technical development on that. We don't have it. We don't have enough uh, technical capacity. You know, technology doesn't come from the air. It comes from investing in people and making much more efforts on the universities and research centers, like we did on nuclear energy 20 years ago or 30 years ago. We are not doing that. We should do it. Third prices. It's quite amazing that in Germany, they produce more electricity, photovoltaic electricity by head than in Spain. It's quite amazing. Why, it's, why it's so? There's much more sun in Spain than in Germany. It's because the photovoltaic panels are less expensive in Germany than in Spain? No. It's because the system of pricing electricity. Yeah. Another different way of pricing electricity would make Spanish people produce and consume more solar uh, energy. And finally, a word about biofuels. Nobody has said anything about that. But one of the big issues on this evening vote in Brussels will be if we are going to keep or not the 10% target on biofuels on, uh, tra for transportation. This is one of the big issues, and it has been strongly related with the food crisis. On the last month, everybody has been blaming biofuels development, especially uh, ethanol as a substitute of gasoline, saying that it's one of the uh, responsibles for the, the food crisis. I am going to vote in favor of maintaining this 10% target, because I think that the bioethanol uh, ethanol has been unfairly blamed for the current food crisis, despite having little real influences on prices. I think this is a big question to be discussed a lot. The, the, the cereal who has increased more the price is, the, is rice, and rice is not being used at all for producing biofuels. The cereal who has decreased prices is sugar. And cane sugar is being used mainly for bio, bioethanol. So I don't think any econometrician could find a, a, a real relationship between development of biofuels, bioethanol, and food <coughs> prices. But nevertheless, it's one of the big questions on the table. Can we develop this or not? Is this a threat for the food security in the world, or there is a complementarity for farmers all around the world, especially in developing countries, between food producing and energy producing from, from, uh, from vegetables. India has a lot of things to say about that, with this Hastropa uh, plant who grows in the desert and serves for nothing else than to produce uh, bio, biofuels. There is no other alternative for transportation today than biofuels, because electricity, car, and hydrogen, it's very good, but not for tomorrow. But for tomorrow, or for today, we already have an, an, an alternative. This alternative has been uh, in collision with the food crisis. What do we think about that? In, the, in Brussels today, we will have to say yes or not to this target of 10%. My position will be in favor, because I think that there is an opportunity, there is uh, the capacity of developing both things at the same time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Burry.
Kubish do you need to leave now? Okay, um, I'm very sorry Mr Kubish has to leave us because as you no doubt aware there's an extraordinary European Council meeting in Brussels today to discuss the crisis in Georgia and relations with Russia and other regional partners. But I'd like to thank Mr Kubish very much for his contribution. Thank you very much. Okay, let's move quickly on with our next speaker, Mr. Ali Saig, the President of the World Renewable Energy Council. Mr. Saig, please. Mr. Chairman, I'm delighted. I'm grateful to the uh, minister who just left who invited me to this meeting. Um, I'm going to show you the reality where we are and uh, try to um, address the three issues, the climate change, present situation, and the solution of renewable energy. We obviously have a solution, but there is no one single magic solution which we can say this is it. We have to have a basket of solutions and the answer is there and we're doing it. If you see the progress since 1960 in renewable energy, this is really the only saver we're going to have. The climate change, I don't have to um, keep on telling you what we're seeing and what's happening. But it's a reality. We can only delay global warming. But that is happening. And that is what we are after. These are the um, few items which you have to put in your mind by the Stern report and the devastation which result out of this. However, in general, the CO2 emission, now China, surpassed the United States. And we also should not be hypocritical. We should not pollute the world in Europe and the United States and force our will in developing countries and say, don't develop because there is another solution for you. Look at the situation where we are. This is how our city is at night. Do we need that light all night? And look at the situation of cars. The United States has two million, 200 million cars in the road, and they use 3.6 million barrels of oil a day just for cars. Okay, my friend mentioned that the fossil fuel will be with us. This is, in fact, is a reality. 76% it will be fossil fuel with us at least for the next 20, 30 years. But nevertheless, renewable energy contributed to nearly 24% at the present. Where are the solutions? In the PV, you see there's the progress, and this is one of the most uh, promising solution, and when I say promising, there are plans to put up 4,000 megawatts in PV in the United States and some part of Europe, especially Spain. Some solutions around the world, this is in Japan, BIPV, build, build integrated PV, and you can design a house, a beautifully house, with the PV. It's absolutely everywhere. These are the large-scale PV in various parts of the world. Go to the wind, which we um, talk about wind, and this is again our main saver. And if you cannot build them onshore, then of course you go to offshore. Another geothermal, some many, many countries, including this country, could tap the geothermal stream. 
And then you can see around the world, geothermal is a reality as well. Um, hydropower. Again, the hydropower not necessarily has to be a, a huge big project. It could be pico power, 200, 300 kilowatts, 100 kilowatts. And again, you can see many countries um, listed here. And you can see the big and the small we all require. Again, marine current technology, this is an area which is very, very important to Europe. And we're spending billions and millions on this. And I think UK is taking the lead in this. Portugal is the same. Um, and these are, in fact, the situation, how much you can generate by the system um, kilowatt per meter in various parts of Europe. Fuel cell, that's another solution. And again, the European Commission doing great work in this. And uh, this is an area which is we need to spend more money and uh, make it a reality. Biomass, biogas, and bioethanol and biodiesel. Again, my colleague just mentioned, and Denmark is doing very, very well. Um, this is the area which we need to also excel in this. And copper system, of course, which we're doing now incineration, um, this is an area which we need to excel as well. And of course, this is the ethanol um, project, various, various parts of the world. And this is the amount of the target in various parts of the world as exist. Landfill gas, we must not forget this. This is a big area. And again, you can see several examples of this globally. Solar thermal and building. And of course, big power plant. And this is where the Club of Rome and many countries now investing to have two major projects, one for the world to supply electricity and one for Europe, only part of Algeria, small part of Sahara deserts. And of course, these are the progress in various renewable. But the issue, Mr. Chairman, is are we serious about it? Are we really saying and practicing what we say, or are we just paying lip service? And that is where we need to get the right from the wrong. And I think we have to think, as, as we hear Edward Beer coming down the stairs, and with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Say. Okay, our next speaker, who I suspect won't be quoting from Winnie the Pooh, is uh, Dr. Fred Singer, President of the Science Environmental Policy Project from the United States. Thank you. Uh, first, you have to understand uh, where I come from. Um, I am. Uh, a strong proponent of the idea that global warming is not a problem. It's a non-problem. As far as I know, the only major academy of sciences that, that states this is the Russian Academy, and we agree. In the United States, thousands of scientists have expressed the same view. 31,000 have signed a petition against the Kyoto Protocol, and therefore uh, state clearly that they don't believe that human-made global warming is a problem. A group of us have uh, produced a report. The group is called the NIPCC. You will find the report on the internet. Just remember IPCC and put an N in front of it, which could be non-IPCC or never IPCC. But actually, it stands for Non-Governmental International Panel on Climate Change. We represent some 30 scientists from 16 countries. 
And we have uh, produced this report, which is being expanded now. The title of the report tells the story. It says, Nature, not human activity, rules the climate. In other words, climate changes, even in the 20th century, are mostly naturally caused, and the human component is negligibly small. That's our view. Once you accept that view, and it is backed up in the report by scientific evidence, once you accept the view, which is opposed to the view of the IPCC, once you accept that view, it means that carbon dioxide is not a pollutant. And the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is essentially immaterial or irrelevant. However, most non-scientists, most politicians don't believe this yet. They will. And therefore, this idea that carbon dioxide has to be reduced is distorting energy policy. And that is what I wish to talk about. The distortion of energy policy is a serious matter. Climate issues are not serious. But energy policy is serious because it affects directly the economy of nations and the well-being of people. And what we want in energy policy is two goals. We want low cost and we want security. Low cost and security. Once you think about it that way, the problem doesn't seem to be particularly daunting. As far as electricity is concerned, we know that coal and nuclear produce electricity very well and have been doing this for decades. It's cheap, relatively speaking, and it's secure. <coughs> coal comes mainly from native resources, as in the United States, it's imported from South Africa, Australia, Poland, and the United States. Uranium is cheap at the moment and will remain so for foreseeable future. They work well, they're proven, and they produce large quantities of electricity is what we need. I'm not against wind and solar on principle, except they're very expensive. Why? Well, because they're dilute and intermittent. They require storage. So small amounts of wind and solar are probably not objectionable. However, you should keep in mind is that they're more costly than coal and nuclear. What about transportation? For transportation, you have to have liquid fuel like oil or synthetic oils. Synthetic oil can be made in various ways at relatively low cost, lower than the present price of crude oil. And another fuel to keep in mind is compressed natural gas. Natural gas should not be used to create electricity. It is much too precious. Natural gas should be phased out for electricity production and replaced by coal and nuclear. And natural gas can be used to run buses, trucks, and all kinds of fleet vehicles. I've been asked by the moderator to say something about technology. What technologies do we need? For coal burning, we really don't need any new technology. We know how to burn coal relatively cleanly. We can take out what are called pollutants, and we have clean coal. Of course, it produces carbon dioxide, but carbon dioxide, we've agreed, or you will agree with me, is not a pollutant. In fact, it's generally agreed that carbon dioxide is good for agriculture and forestry. It's plant food. It's what makes plants grow, grow faster and better. We want more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Let me repeat this. We want more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It is good. We've had more carbon dioxide in the, on the Earth. 
In prehistoric times, we've had up to 20 times the present level of carbon dioxide. We don't have any evidence, contrary to the IPCC, that carbon dioxide is in any way dangerous. And I certainly don't agree with Sir David King, who says, and I quote him, that by the end of this century, the Antarctic will be the only inhabitable place on the Earth. That's his view. And he's entitled to it, but I think he's wrong. What about technology for nuclear? Uh, there we have many choices. The present nuclear pressurized water reactor works. It works well. It's not the best choice, but it works. There are other possibilities. China is experimenting with the pebble bed nuclear reactor. If they succeed in making it commercially feasible, we should copy it. India is experimenting with thorium as a nuclear fuel. If they solve the problem, if it works, we should copy it because thorium is a vast resource. So nuclear can take care of us for thousands of years. The only point is to build breeder reactors that will turn uranium-238 into a fissionable material for thousands more years of nuclear fuel. There's no problem, even after we run out of coal. Finally, for transportation fuel, methane can be turned into a liquid fuel, such as gasoline or dimethyl ether. Here, China is experimenting, and I, I think on a mass scale, with producing DME from natural gas. Natural gas is available throughout the world. In many cases, it cannot be accessed because you cannot build a pipeline to it, but you can turn it into a liquid fuel and then ship it by tanker. Finally, most important is efficiency. Efficiency is always a good idea. It has nothing to do with climate change. It has to do with saving money. Efficiency is a good thing. The most efficient power plants are the ones that use cogeneration. And as my colleague, Mr. Koch, has mentioned, Denmark leads the world in cogeneration, but they have a special situation. They have uh, power plants located near big population centers. So you want coal plants and nuclear plants near big population centers where you can use the steam to heat the city and do other tasks. That is what we should aim for, high efficiency, so that we can make energy cheaper. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singer. Have a look. Okay, our next speaker is Ms. Annika Carlson Kanyama, uh, Program Manager of Climate Tools at the Swedish Defence Research Agency. Okay. Well, I'm one of these many people who believe that the evidence put together by IPCC. I'm one of these many people who believe that the evidence put together by the IPCC or that climate change is caused by human action, human emissions of greenhouse gases. I think that evidence is overwhelming, and I think it would be stupid not to act upon it. And if we look upon the challenges ahead, if we consider the climate models, and what will happen if we continue <coughs> to emit greenhouse gases as business as usual, it's a world which we can't imagine. Uh, there are even scientists now warning that by the end of the century we will may have a sea level rise of several meters, which will, of course, shape our world into something different. So we really have to take action to curb climate change. I also want to point out that only 60% of global warming is caused by carbon dioxide. There is a lot of discussion about carbon dioxide here. And the other 40% is caused by other greenhouse gases, such as methane and nitrous oxides, and I'm going to come back to that. When we think about the potential to produce renewable energy, it is without doubt so that renewable energy will demand certain resources in terms of land and water, at least when it comes to biofuel. So we will certainly have a competition on these resources when it comes to other purposes, such as producing food. And in this context, I want to add that a report finalized, I think, one and a half years ago, 
by the Food and Agricultural Organization came to the conclusion that 18% of the greenhouse gases is currently caused by livestock industry. The livestock industry which also uses a lot of land and water which, may be, which we were made to use, want to use to produce renewable energy. Looking at my research, I'm a researcher, and my research has mainly focused on energy efficiency at the user end level among with households and industries. And it's a fact that there exist a lot of technologies for energy efficiency out there that are not implemented. They may be even cost efficient, but they are not used. You can take the example, for example, of energy saving light bulb, bulbs or electric kettles if you look at the household levels. They are there, they are cost efficient, they are energy efficient, but they are not put into use. And my main message today is that I think we need a much more strong focus on energy efficiency. We need to build visions of how an energy efficient society would look like, both for the purpose of energy security and for climate change. And in building that vision for an energy efficient society, I think we in fact, have to go out of the ordinary and imagine the extraordinary, as somebody said her, here, because climate change requires extraordinary measures. If we, for example, take a look at the household level, commonly it's about one-fourth of the energy use for developed countries in, at the household level. And if we look at the household level and, con and consider both direct and indirect energy, the indirect energy is all the energy embodied in all the products we buy, we find that indirect energy is usually 60% and direct 40%. So one way of looking at the households is that they consume energy in direct and indirect forms. Looking now at the three points I want to make, as I said, I think we need a much more strong focus on energy efficiency than before. And I think a lot of the technologies that seem to have been developed have not been developed together with the end users, the people who are actually using them whether they are in companies or at home. And it seems to me from research together with my colleagues that a lot of the, this work is carried out by technicians or uh, these people who have uh, own big estates with not very much understanding of everyday life and the limitations of that. So I really see that the soft sciences, the behavioral sciences, have, has a very important role to fill in the future. Um, I think also what we have to do is to have a much more better focus on systems analysis. We have to look at the whole system we would devise policies, so not as to overlook and to enter into maladaptation practices. And we also have to take, make use of all the policy measures that are available to politicians, financial incentives, technological improvements, legislation. We have shown that people can change behavior if a number of policy measures are put into place, for example, when it comes to smoking and when it comes to sorting our waste, for example. <coughs> we have had numerous policy measures there in the, UE, in the European Union and things have changed. And they could change as well when it comes to energy efficiency. Today the development at the household level concerning energy use is that energy electricity use is increasing. It's, it is especially increasing because a number of the gadgets fly use a lot of standby electricity. Some years ago, the, European, uh, the International en a Energy Agency issued a report that said thing things that go blip in the night, and according to that, 10% of the electricity use is for standby, <coughs> completely unnecessary. Clearly, governments and ed energy agencies have a big role to fill when it comes to convincing or forcing or encouraging companies to produce things that do not use such amount, large amounts of standby electricity. I think also the challenge of climate change is extraordinary, as somebody said before, and it, we need extraordinary measures. And I want to at least propose the idea that we discuss changes in diets as a way of promoting energy efficiency. When we look at the energy use over the life cycle for pro products such as beef, and compare it with beans, for example, <coughs> there is a difference of a factor 30. And when we look at the land and water use, the difference is equally large. By eating a more vegetarian diet, doesn't mean everybody has to become a vegetarian, but that by eating a more vegetarian diet, we will, produce, we will promote energy efficiency, we will lessen the emissions of 
uh, methane and nitrous oxide, and we will free, set, set free land and water that can be used for producing renewable energy. I think also we have to be much better when it comes to targeting our main groups for energy efficient policies. And I want to measure that current research has really shown that there is a gender difference in energy use. Men use more uh, energy for transportation than women do. And I think it's important to have that kind of knowledge of who is the audience for policy measures if you want people to adopt more energy efficient technologies and to convince people to live in, in a more energy efficient lifestyle. And I think a lot of people in Europe and in other part, parts of the world are quite sensitive to these messages because uh, many people are worried about climate change. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Mr. Peter Bort, Director of the Long-Term Cooperation and Policy Analysis Office at the International Energy Agency. Mr. Bort, please. Thank you. <clears throat> yes, the International Energy Agency assumes um, with the Nobel Prize winners uh, that, um, that the climate issue is a serious one. Um, in our energy technology perspectives that has been published uh, before summer, um, we've developed two scenarios, um, of course, next to the reference scenarios in which uh, CO2 emissions go up with 50% in the coming uh, 25 years. In our ACT scenario, um, emission will go up and then go down, and um, in the year 2050 it will be the same as, um, as now. And then the um, global concentration of CO2 will be 550 ppm particles per, per million, um, and temperature will go up up to three, de three uh, degrees. Let's say that scenario is more or less the same as, as the policy that has been implemented by Denmark in the past. So let's say by such a scenario, you can reach a stabilization of uh, energy consumption and maybe a small uh, decrease of, um, uh, of CO2. Um, we don't need um, ra uh, <coughs> uh, new, really new technologies to implement it. It's really about implementation of existing techno technologies. When we want to go further, and this was our blue scenario, in which the target is 450 ppm, um, temperature will go up by two degrees instead of three, then we really need uh, new technologies as well. So it has to do with the ambition uh, the world uh, will formulate. Um, always, and that's the second point, as has been said by many speakers before, energy efficiency is the start. And it's a good start because it's always also good for uh, security and it will save money to some extent. So that's always a good start. With electricity, I think it has been said by many speakers before, we both need renewables and nuclear. Um, and the big problem here is um, what to do with coal. Let's say to some extent coal power generation can become more efficient. That makes a lot of sense. A sense. But in a real aggressive uh, CO2 scenario, we need uh, CCS, carbon capture and storage. That hasn't been demonstrated to a great stand up to now, but without CCS, we think an aggressive CO2 policy cannot be reached. So it is necessary to do it, even when it hasn't been proven up to now. So, and from a, a purely, uh, let's say, security point of view, it is not necessary. We have to be clear on that as well. So CCS is, is the real uh, a problem we have to discuss because if we want uh, to, to reach the targets, we need to implement 20 big demonstration plans in the coming 10 years because otherwise we are too late. So here this is really a question of time. That's electricity. Of course, industry has to change. That's more difficult than, than electricity. Transport is the most challenging one and the most expensive one to change, but there are so many possibilities that if we want, it can be done. Thirdly, at, this, at the same time, we know that the non-OECD countries will contribute 90 to 95% of the growth of emission. 
but the OECD countries have been contributing to CO2 emission up to now in a majority. So both parties have to play their role, and uh, we, we think that that can be done. At this moment, for our uh, new world energy outlook, uh, we are developing what we call an international hybrid approach. And in this hybrid approach, we try to combine three types of policies. One, of course, is cap and trade. Cap and trade systems will lead to a CO2 price, and CO2 prices will lead to new financial flows, for example, to emerging economies. Secondly, we think we need the sectoral approaches. By origin, this is a Japanese idea, and in, by sectoral approaches, you have an agreement, for example, in iron and steel, or in cement, or in aluminium, that something will happen in several countries. It is an agreement, in the end, by governments next to their uh, national uh, ambitions. And thirdly, we think we need internationally recognized national policies and measures, which can be different. For example, in um, emerging economies, it can have relative, uh, relative uh, targets, and in uh, OECD countries, it will have absolute targets. And that's, again, a way to, to install financial flows in the end from the rich countries to the emerging economies. So we think all of these countries have to play a role, um, and um, the difficult part will be CCS. Thank you. Okay, and thank you for a nice brief presentation. It helps us to keep on time. Our next speaker is Ms. Geraldine Kutas, the International Director of the Brazilian Sugar Cane Industry Association, and I understand the International Advisor to the President. Thank you, Ms. Kutas. Thank you very much. Brazil is uh, an emerging country with a pretty good growth rate, and obviously it needs energy to support these growth rates. Our country has made the choice of energy diversification and energy renewable energy. 46% um, of the energy consumed in Brazil is made out of renewables. This is pretty impressive if you consider that the average for the world is 13%, and in OECD countries it's only 6%. The majority of this renewable energy is coming from sugarcane, sugarcane that is used to produce ethanol for the transport sector, and ethanol and sugarcane that is used to produce bioelectricity, supplying currently 4% of the world Brazilian electricity needs. Our government has placed a lot of emphasis in the transport sector, and this is not something new. This is something that we started 35 years ago when the first oil shock occurs. So we have a pretty long experience with ethanol as a renewable fuel in the transport sector. And if you allow me, I would like to share with you some of the Brazilian experience and also dispel some myth about the Brazilian ethanol experience. First of all, ethanol is a real alternative to substitute a significant part of the oil consumption for the transportation sector. Today in Brazil, we have managed to replace 50% of our gasoline consumption by ethanol, and this share is increasing every year. Ethanol is price competitive. It's competitive at $40 a barrel. And today, a liter of ethanol in Brazil costs 50% less than a liter of gasoline. Our government has fostered the conception of renewable fuel in two ways. The first one is a mandatory blend. We have 25% of ethanol blended in each single liter of gasoline in the country. And since 2003, we have introduced flex fuel vehicles. Flex fuel vehicles are vehicles that can run either with 100% of ethanol, 100% of gasoline, or any mix of the two. So the consumer decides at the pumps if he would like to fill in the tank with ethanol, with gasoline, or with any mix. Ethanol can be used for other transportation systems, not only cars. You can use ethanol in buses, with E95, with Swedish technology, in fact. You can use ethanol in small airplanes. We have the Ipanema model from uh, Embraer running on ethanol. You can use it 
in motorcycle. We will have next year flex fuel motorcycle. Uh, and big cities like Sao Paulo, it makes a lot of difference. So ethanol is not limited to the car sector. And we have very promising research to be able to use ethanol in diesel motors also. Secondly, ethanol reduces significantly CO2 emission. Sugarcane ethanol can reduce CO2 emission and GHG emission up to 90%. And with the cogeneration of bioelectricity sold to the national grid, we can achieve more than 100% of GHG reduction. The energy balance of ethanol is also very impressive. You can get 9.3 units of renewable fuel just using one unit of fossil fuels. So it's very efficient. When it comes to uh, the environment, no, ethanol production in Brazil is not provoking the deforestation of the Amazon rainforest or any other biodiversity area. 87% of sugarcane production in Brazil takes place in the center south of the country. This is 2,500 kilometers away from the Amazon, barely the distance between the Vatican and Moscow. And in this region, there are reliable rainfall, so we do not need to irrigate sugarcane. In fact, because sugarcane is made of 70% of water, now there are new technologies that allow us to produce water from sugarcane and to export it to the cities in the neighborhood of the mills. The 50% of ethanol replacing gasoline in Brazil are produced only on 1% of the Brazilian Arab land. This means 3.4 million hectares. At the comparison, 50% of our Arab land is dedicated to pastures in Brazil. Soybean occupies 6% of Arab land. So we are far from those numbers. And in addition, we still have Arab land available. I understand that this is not the case of some other countries, but in Brazil, we have 100 million hectares of Arab land still available to be used. And in addition, because we have a huge meat industry that is not yet very efficient, we have a lot of degraded pastures that each year are released because the productivity of the meat sector is increasing. The average rate you know, of, of um, head of cattle per hectare is 0.9 head of cattle per hectare in Brazil. I would love to have this space to live, honestly. So just increasing the density of head of cattle per hectare to 1.4, as it is the case in the state of Sao Paulo, we will release 70 million hectares for other crop um, production. Sugarcane ethanol, therefore, is not competing with food production. First of all, because we use the same sugarcane stock to produce three products, sugar, ethanol, and bioelectricity. We are just using different parts of the stock of sugarcane to produce the three products. The planted area in Brazil for all the crops has increased dramatically, and areas for soybean or for corn or for livestock I can increase much more than sugarcane. And in fact, over the last 10 years, while the sugarcane industry was expanding, the production of grains has doubled in the country. So really, we can produce food and fuel at the same time with no competition. Finally, sugarcane ethanol is not a Brazilian solution. Brazil, Brazil started this experience before other countries, but it's not only a Brazilian solution. It's a solution for the diversification of energy sources, but also for the diversification of suppliers. There are more than 100 countries in the world that can produce sugarcane, while currently we have 20 countries exporting oil. But it is pretty ironic that ethanol is facing very high tariff and non-tariff barriers while oil is traded almost freely. So it raised the question that are we serious about renewables? Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Our next speaker is Mr. Mei Rong, and forgive me, my Chinese is as non-existent as my Slovenian. He's an executive director of the Chanda Foundation for International Studies. Please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm not an expert on 
climate change and nor European, so that I am not in a position to answer your question, which you put at the beginning of the panel discussion. Rather, I would like to brief you a little bit on the positions and the views of China on the topic which we are discussing and um, what we are doing in China or we are, what we are planning in China to do. Altogether, in five points. First point, the large-scale exploitation and utilization of energy resources is one of the major causes of environmental pollution and climate change. Climate change is an event environmental issue, but basically is a development issue, and it should be addressed within the framework of <coughs> sustainable development. In handling the relationship between energy exploitation and utilization and climate change, a sound, we, uh, we should proceed from the need to achieve a sound balance between or among economic growth social development, and environmental protection. But ensuring of economic growth at co take the strengthening of sustainable development capacity as the goal, focus on conserving energy and optimizing energy mix, and make technological advances as the pillar, so as to constantly improve the capacity of the international community to mitigate and adapt to climate change. This is uh, what we think, what we uh, see this problem. The second point, China is among the countries seriously affected by the negative impact of climate change. When looking at the present emission issue in China, it is necessary for the international community to take into account three factors. First, China is still a developing country in the process of industrialization and modernization. Unlike many EU countries, the Chinese people's living standard is still very low, it's not very high. China's central task now is to develop the economy and improve people's livelihood. Second, China's per capita emission and historic emission are much lower than developed countries. A significant share of China's total emissions falls into the category of survival emission, which is necessary to meet the people's basic needs. Third, as a result of changes, international division of labor and the relocation of international manufacturing industry China faces increasing pressure of international transferred emission while its products are shared by the whole world. Third point, as a responsible nation, China attaches great importance on climate change. Conserving resources and protecting the environment is our basic and constant <coughs> state policy. We are making efforts to ensure that our industry structure, growth model, and consumption pattern are energy and resource efficient and environment friendly. We have in line with our economic and social development plans and sustainable development strategy formulated China's national climate change program, set up the national leading group to address climate change under the leadership of Prime Minister, promulgated a series of laws, laws and the regulations and adopted a host of measures to tackle climate change. We take energy saving and emission reduction as our starting point. We have taken serious measures, including conserving energy, improving energy mix, raising energy efficiency, and have achieved noticeable results. We have set the clear targets of reducing energy intensity per unit of GDP by 20% from 2005 level by the year 2010. We have endeavored to increase the renewable energy consumption to 10% of the total energy consumption till 2010 or so. 
China attaches great importance to the energy, science, and technology, and gives a top priority to the development of it through the training of talented people in energy, science, and technology, improving of policies, laws, regulations, and a technical standard. A favorable policy environment for energy technology has been created. China will also promote mechanism construction for renewable energy development and foster a constant and stably expanding market for renewable energy based on the principle of integrating govern, government guidance, policy support, and market force. Fourth point, the progress and innovation of science and technology plays a fundamental and central role in our endeavor to address climate change. The international community should establish an effective technology cooperation mechanism to promote the research, development, deployment, and transfer of technology, eliminate barriers to technology cooperation, initiate incentive measures for technology cooperation, and establish a special fund for international technology cooperation so that environment and the climate friendly, climate friendly technologies are accessible and affordable to developing countries. China is at the stage of large-scale infrastructure construction and is in urgent need of technology for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. There's a huge potential for, for cooperation in the field of clean and the renewable energy between China and developed countries, especially countries from the European Union. And I believe that our technology cooperation will move faster. The last point was increasing negative impact of global climate change and the threat to energy security, the international community should, from the viewpoint of achieving sustainable development of humanity, discuss and consider the establishment of the future of a future world energy supply system using resources that are clean, economical, safe, and reliable. Meanwhile, we should also appropriately handle the problems concerning financial import, intellectual property right, and technology dissemination so that to benefit <coughs> all countries, enable them to share humanity's achievements and address the challenge of climate change together. And by the way, I would like to say that I share many of the views which my Indian colleague has put at the beginning of our discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Our final speaker for the first part of the session is Mr. Hans van der Loo, Head of the European Union Liaison Office for Shell International. Mr. van der Loo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, this is how it often goes. All sorts of advisors, policymakers, research tanks, and you listen to it, lots of speakers, a lot of distinguished speakers, not always aligned advice and opinions, and you can think about lunch, but if you're the industry, you have to go and do it. But what is it that you have to go and do if you've got such varied views? Um, predicting is, um, is difficult, especially when it concerns the future. And I sometimes liken the whole climate debate to um, paying insurance. I mean, I pay an insurance for my car, and I drive the car, but yet I hope I won't get an accident in spite of the fact that I got insurance. The IPCC uh, actually has convened at certain intervals, and they've actually, because they're very wise people, they know that the whole energy system, the planet that we live on, is an extremely complex uh, thing. And so they don't actually say it is like this or it is like that. They attach a percentage of probability to it. But at the last meeting, they did say it was 96% probable that the global warming was due to human activities. Now, I really hope for my kids that actually Fred is right. I really hope that Fred is right for my kids. But if I have to bet 4% against 96% and I'm a rational person, you know where I put my money. 
I start paying the insurance just in case. But I pay the insurance and hope Fred is right. Now, yesterday, the representative of the French presidency said something that is very close to our heart, and that is, you know, when you talk about things like energy and climate change, what we want to see is facts, maps, and figures. Because very few people in this room will appreciate the enormity of the energy diet of the world. And I do see there's some people here from all producing countries here, even a minister sitting up front. Now, he will understand. You probably all know what one barrel of oil is. You can probably imagine one standing here on the podium. You can perhaps imagine this room full of barrels of oil. But did you realize that the world every day, and actually my neighbor here said already, was three and a half a million barrels a day just for transportation in America, but the world energy consumption is 245 million <coughs> barrels per day. If I express all forms of energy, so also nuclear and hydro and wind, in barrels, that is how much the world consumes. Actually, it's only about 85 million barrels of real oil and another 60 in gas, and then, of course, the others, but that is how much it is. Now, to make a big change in that is a huge challenge. And Josep already indicated that the renewable part of that, you know, is about 5 million barrels per day. But as a percentage, it's very small. Now, it's very simple. Fossil resources are finite. So one day it will be over, although that will be a uh, very long way because I will show you uh, that the difficulty there is actually not with the... Um, reserves or the availability, it is with the consequences of using it and with the actual availability, because if you live over an oil well, you can't run your car out of that, out of that knowledge. But let's go back to uh, maps. If you uh, have traveled the world, then you will know that maps actually depend on where you are in the world. For example, I lived myself seven years in the Far East, and actually the maps do not look like the ones that we know in the West, because in the West, maps have a complete Atlantic Ocean, and the Pacific is broken up. But, for example, a map in China will actually have the Pacific entirely there and the Atlantic bro Ocean broken up at the side. So that means that the real Far East is actually New York and the Wild West is London. So I just want to make the point of perspective because how you look at the world and how you look at energy and climate change depends very much whether you sit in an Indian or a Chinese chair or in a Danish or a Dutch chair or a Brussels chair. But this is yet another map. This is not about how you break up the oceans. This map represents the size of the countries by their populations. Now, I always have great joy in showing this map to Australian colleagues because there's a little shrivel there at the bottom. <laughs> now, look at the size of Canada or indeed of Russia, but also do look at the size of China and the size of India. When I was born, some 45 years ago, there were 3 billion people on this planet. Today, there are 6.2 billion people on this planet. And by the time my pension insurance company tells me I will have reached my sell-by date, which is somewhere 2045, according to their statistics, there will be 9 billion people on this planet. That means that in my lifetime alone, the global population will have tripled. This has never, ever happened before and is unlikely to happen afterwards because of correlations between GDP per capita and number of children. But what that means is that we are actually at the eve of an unprecedented growth in global demand. So the 245 million <coughs> barrels of oil per day, we think will grow to double that by 2050. And why? Because you may have done your calculation with me and said, oh, wait a sec, you said 6 billion now, 9 billion then, so that's plus 50%. Well, that's right. Population will increase by first 50%. But look at the wealth of the countries that are the biggest ones. They have, rightfully, aspirations to grow economically, and that means a 50% growth in population we think will be associated with a 100% growth in energy demand. And yet, the world thinks and probably has a problem with the current level of CO2 emissions. So we have seen as a, a challenge is that the world needs twice as much energy in 2050 and needs half as much of the CO2 it's got today. And that is a huge challenge. The people that went this morning to the uh, session about the Al Gore slides, you know, he talks about an in or one inconvenient truth. 
we go around the world to talk about three hard truths. That's not to outdo him, it's just, you know, he looks at the past and the current situation, we try to look a little bit forward. I explained to you already the first hard truth, that global energy demand is growing much faster than it was before. The second hard truth is that the easy oil and gas, which is still the most uh, prolific uh, form of energy with which the diet gets fed today, the easy forms of oil and gas supply will actually struggle to keep pace with the demand growth. And that is not, I do not want to be alarmist that there is not enough energy in the world. There's plenty of energy in the world. But as I said, if you live on a gas well, you can't heat your house with it. Or if you live on an oil well, you can't run your car on it. It needs to be taken out. And so where there is a real tightness is the production capacity in the world. Not the reserves, the production capacity. Now, easy oil is a, is a technical term. That's the kind of stuff, you know, that uh, you and I can do if on a Saturday afternoon you stand in the desert in the Middle East, you put up your sleeves, you start digging, and you got a gusher. That is easy oil. Now, that indeed, some people may have heard about peak oil. That indeed is about over. There's not much of that left. But there is a lot left much, much deeper, and that's more difficult oil. So not easy oil and gas, but difficult oil and gas. But because it is difficult, you need the technology, some of the technology that not, may not exist today to get it out. Or it will be a lot more costly to get it out. Or you may need political access to get to it. And all those factors are actually limitations that will deliver that second hard truth that the easy forms of oil and gas will begin to struggle. Now, how will the world react to that? Well, I can tell you one thing. The world will not react to it by using less energy. That will not happen because the energy hunger is there. And also, energy use in a way is good because it helps produce good things and it helps better livelihood and, and worthwhile uh, lifestyles. But what will the world then do if it can't get the easy oil and yet wants the energy? And I'll say a bit about renewables in a second, but I would like to say a bit first about coal. Because with Peter's outfit, the IEA in Paris, we agree that there will be a global flight into coal. Now then we actually have what the Americans call a double whammy. So the first whammy is we get more energy demand, which is not very good from a CO2 emissions point of view. But the second whammy is that we're going to meet that demand in the first instance with more carbon dioxide intensive forms of energy, i.e. coal. So that's going exactly in the wrong direction. So you're going to consume more energy, and it's going to be more carbon-intensive energy. And that actually then brings us to the uh, solution, the question that Simon talked about, what are we going to do about that? But just to drive this point really, really home, and even if you're not mathematicians, this is the formula that determines CO2 emissions in the world, put in very simple terms. It is made up by the number of people in the world, times the wealth of those people, because all of us have a higher carbon footprint than poor people in the world. Just think of how you got here in the first place. Times the energy efficiency. For example, in Japan, this is very good because they have the lowest energy consumption per dollar GDP. And in Ukraine, they're at the other end of the list because they got the highest usage of energy per dollar GDP. So that's if you weigh the energy intensity or the energy efficiency. <coughs> times the carbon intensity of the forms of energy that you use. So, for example, that is very bad for coal, and it is very good for wind. Now, the problem is that this number will only go up, so it's not going to help us to bring CO2 emissions down. This here also will only go one way, and it's going to go up, because, you know, people will develop economically, and therefore this will contribute to more emissions. And that actually leaves us only with two things that we really can do as a global community to reduce the carbon footprint of the world, that is to go either for less energy per unit of GDP or less CO2 per unit of energy. Now, Simon asked, what do you think are the best technologies or the most promising technologies going forward? Well, there is not one good technology to go forward because, as I said earlier, it depends on which chair you sit. It is a rainbow coalition of solutions. But by and large, they fall in two broad categories. The first category is reduce emissions. And that can either be done by using cleaner forms of energy. For example, if you could shift more to natural gas, because natural gas within the category of fossil fuels is cleaner than, say, coal. Nuclear power has lots of issues. 
but from a CO2 point of view, it actually helps in this track. By the way, yesterday, I was delighted to see two engineers on the forum of politicians, because it helps if politicians understand what's really going on, like Giuseppe, by the way. And uh, they were talking about the dream of nuclear. Well, Wolfgang Schüssel has got data, right? There are indeed, at this moment in time, 429 nuclear power plants in the world. What he did not say is that by the midpoint of this century, 40% of those plants will be decommissioned. Now, in our scenarios going forward, we actually forecast a growth in nuclear of only 15%. And people say, hey, after what you tell here, why not more? Well, the challenge to increase nuclear by about 15% to the midpoint of this century is huge. Because it means that you have to rebuild the 40% that gets decommissioned and build another 15%. Together, that makes about 55%. So that means in the next 42 years, the world has to build, new build, rebuild half of the existing installed installations. And then, what was also not mentioned, whilst uh, uranium is available, it's actually concentrated in even fewer countries than oil and gas is concentrated. And, of course, if you have twice as much nuclear power plants, you will go through the reserves twice as fast. I'm not speaking against nuclear. I think it's a legitimate role in it, but we should think about it in realistic terms. Renewables is obvious. Bioproducts people have talked about. Peter spoke very eloquently about uh, carbon capture and storage. The reason why I made it bigger in this picture is that it is different from the other ones. The other ones actually are ways to make energy that emit less CO2. But because the world is about to take off in an enormous way into coal, we also have to think of ways of reducing emissions by taking the emissions that do take place and dealing with them. So that's one track. The second track is reduced demand. And I won't go into the details, but you know, there's a whole range of things you can do with forms of transportation, buildings, low energy appliances, and doing things differently. So we often try to help our audience with names, easy to remember names. So a couple of years ago, we spoke about Tina. Tina is a lady, but Tina is also an acronym for there is no alternative for population growth and globalization. Tina has actually given birth to a daughter, and her daughter is called Tanya. And Tanya stands for there are no ideal answers. So what should we be doing, and that's then, Mr. Chairman, my answer to, uh, to the question that you put up, is we should make energy efficiency an absolute top priority today. Of the primary energy that the world produces today, only 47% is used usefully, and 53% is wasted. Now, if you understand thermodynamics, then you know you can never achieve 100% efficiency. But I would argue that between where we are and what is technologically possible, there is a big potential for improvement. We have to go massively out to develop low-carbon initiatives, and we have to enable the rapid deployment of CCS. And time here, ladies and gentlemen, plays a big role. We have calculated for the European Commission that the seven-year delay in the world's CCS plans, simply sh doing them, but doing them seven years later, will lead to between 90 and 100 gigatons of avoidable, if we just get our act together and act, uh, avoidable CO2 emissions to the world, which is about 10 ppm. So that is a large chunk of the budget, in inverted commas, that we still got to go. And by the way, I do have some other bad news for you of the so-called budget between the 380 ppm we have and the 550 that we go to, a lot of it has technologically actually already been locked in because the plants that our industry builds typically last 30 years. So all the new builds today will do that. And one point that I've heard, my last point, that nobody spoke about here, but I really would like to stress as being of extreme importance, we have to think about the talent pipeline because this challenge does not only require a lot of money, it also requires a lot of talent. And if you would imagine our vehicle, our, our world to be a vehicle on its way to achieve and meet these, 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 these challenges, then the fuel on which this vehicle runs is talent. And globally, there is a tendency that amongst young people, there's a declining interest in technology. And I would call upon all the policymakers in the world to look at programs in their countries, how they could turn it around. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Hans.
Uh, thanks to all the speakers for some very interesting uh, presentations. We've run slightly later for this session than we uh, originally intended, but it, we still have at least 20 minutes, I think, for discussion and debate. Um, I hope there'll be some questions from the floor, uh, but maybe I could start by um, asking some of the speakers uh, to comment on a particular issue. Uh, Minister Kubish spoke at the beginning um, about the difficulty that basically the electoral cycle in uh, democratic uh, societies is four or five years. Every four or five years, governments have to go back to the polls and, and, and take responsibility for their policy actions. Uh, but the time frame to tackle with climate change is 10, 20, 30 years. Um, how, do you, how do you get over this problem of this, this disjuncture of, the, uh, of the, the time scales? And also, I think there's another timing issue, one about... Um, the European Union is trying to decide what to do, but doesn't know until Copenhagen at the end of next year what the rest of the world is likely to do. Uh, they're keeping a lot of policy options open, but this is a difficult way uh, to decide the best way forward for the European Union. So um, who would, like, would anyone like to, to come in on that issue? Uh, Dr Singer, please. Three worst ideas. The worst idea probably is carbon capture and sequestration. It, it lowers the efficiency by approximately 50%. You have to build two power plants to deliver the same amount of electric power. And it probably won't even work. And it may be dangerous because large amounts of CO2 without oxygen, without oxygen will kill you. The next worst idea is probably LNG, liquefied natural gas. Expensive and insecure. And the next one is the hydrogen economy, which George Bush promoted two years ago, which I think has now died a natural death. And I hope the other two ideas will also die a natural death. Anyone else would like to come in on the, the political timing issue? How, how politicians can actually convince the public to, to do what most people, not everybody agrees, is necessary? I think there, there is a, a strong uh, feeling on European population, at least, that we face uh, a problem, and and people are quite ready to to work in order to solve it. Uh, the problem is once again prices. No? It's very difficult for government to tell people that energy have to be more expensive. Electricity, for example is a good that everybody consumes every day. So to tell people that uh, we cannot provide cheaper energy and we have to reduce consumption, and to reduce consumption price is a good uh, indicator, it's something that uh, at, the, at the last moment all governments are very reluctant to apply a policy of uh, increasing prices in order to reduce consumption. Because the same thing happens with water, no? If water is a free good, nobody's going to save it. If you want to save water, you have to, to, to allocate a price to water. And everybody is ready to pay a price for electricity, but nobody it seems so clearly that water has to have a price because it costs a lot of money to bring clean water, drinkable water to your houses. My experience is that uh, at the last moment when governments have to face the price question, they are very much reluctant to create incentives through prices in order to reduce consumption. Maybe, Mr. Koch, you'd like to come in, because the Danish example almost seems too good to be true, that uh, there was a, a, a policy decision to go very much for renewables. Uh, economically, the price that the country has had to pay is, is negligible, uh, is that because of a, sp a specific environmental sensibility in the Danish population? You, you were at pains to say that your geographical situation is not necessarily particularly advantageous and that policy choices uh, can, can leave you to the right, the right outcomes. What are the, what are the lessons that you would uh, maybe recommend to colleagues in other countries? Uh, three uh, brief points. I think that 
Uh, in Denmark, and I think that is the case in most European countries, there is a growing understanding of the seriousness of not only the uh, greenhouse gas problem, but also the energy security problem and the price problem for energy. And those three factors are cooperating. Uh, you couldn't have had the European climate and energy package if you hadn't had uh, the signs of uh, risk of interruption of gas suppliers from Russia who uh, supply something like 20 to, to uh, 30 percent of the natural gas supplies to Europe. So I think in, 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 European, in the European Union it is easier than in other parts of the world apparently. In other parts of the world I think we are now also seeing uh, the effect of extremely high prices, the effects of uh, the, the different uh, meteorological uh, events. Uh, and uh, I think the European Union has found a rather elegant way uh, to solve the problem of uh, first uh, uh, promising to, to committing themselves to 20%, and if other countries can go on, then uh, that can move to 30%. How, uh, well, how it is possible to convince the population, for instance, the, in the United States of America? That is a billion-dollar question, and I, unfortunately I can't give you an answer on that. But, but I think still the developments, both the two presidential candidates and also, uh, for what that is worth, the last speech of Al Gore indicates that also uh, in U.S. The, the public opinion might move in that direction. Thank you very much. Uh, just, I'd like to move on to another question that I found very new aspect of the debate, uh, and this was from uh, Mr. Saran, the question of intellectual property rights and that somehow sharing uh, new technologies uh, or tra uh, technology transfer would be a way to improve energy efficiency uh, in developing countries. Um, do you, uh, obviously, and, and you have a, a sort of quite, seems to me, a workable notion of how this might work. Maybe I, I think I'd probably like to hear from, from your colleagues um, at an international level, would there be an openness to the idea? Because uh, part of the climate change debate within the European Union, for example, uh, it shades into industrial policy, people saying we can produce environmentally advanced products which we can sell to the rest of the world, we can compensate for the transfer of uh, labour-intensive jobs to developing countries. Uh, so my, my suspicion would, that would be that there would be a reluctance to share IPR or to, or to, or to loosen the grip on IPR, and, and frankly the European Union's or the developed world's relationship with China on, on IPR issues is already, uh, is already quite tense. Uh, so uh, anyone who'd like to come in on that issue? Uh, <coughs> I think it's very important to uh, remember that the only consensus document that we have on dealing with climate change is the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And that has not been repudiated. That has been reaffirmed re, uh, at, at Bali. And I think it is important because we are talking here about Bali. And we are currently engaged in the negotiating process to bring the Bali Action Plan into an implementable uh, action plan. Uh, it is very dangerous to try and overload the climate change issue with issues of competitiveness and trade. The UNFCC and the effort which is required in terms of technology transfer, in terms of financial transfer, has nothing to do with trade. It has nothing to do with competitiveness. So if you start overloading this agenda with competitiveness issues, oh, I cannot really uh, close my coal-based power plant because this will give the Indians an advantage because they have so many coal-fired power plants and they are not uh, expected to uh, you know, close down their plants. If you get into that argument, we will end up by doing nothing. Mm. <laughs> so I think it is very important that this particular extraordinary challenge, if we are talking about, <coughs> is not mixed up with you know, market issues. There is a forum to discuss trade issues in the WTO. There is a forum to discuss competitiveness issue. This is not the place to try and try and get results which you are not able to get in the WTO negotiations. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, let us be let us be clear. If this is really an extraordinary issue, the IPR issue has to be addressed. And the only way that you can diffuse even existing technologies, climate-friendly technologies, in as wide a manner as possible, so that 
as many countries, including emerging countries, adopt these technologies, then unless you deal with this particular issue, you will not be able to get very far. And I again repeat, I am not saying that innovators should not be rewarded. There are ways of rewarding innovators even while making these public goods. And developing countries, certainly India, China can speak for itself, but certainly India would be ready to make its own contribution uh, to that kind of uh, financing. Secondly, as far as new technologies are concerned, Again, developing countries like India may be still far behind uh, you know, the developed Western countries, but we have some scientific talent, we have some uh, infrastructure in research and development, and we see no reason why major countries like Brazil, India, China cannot join together with the European Union and go in for collaborative R&D effort. You know, this is, if, if we are talking about a talent pipeline, our talent is there. I think there is a considerable amount of talent which is available in countries like India, in countries like China, Brazil. They have done a tremendous amount of work, as you heard, in terms of renewable technologies. Why is there reluctance to join together with these countries and really get embarked on a major focused R&D effort in terms of renewable technologies? I think what is lacking is political will. Thank you. Any of our other panelists like to come back on that issue? Hans, briefly, please. I um, agree with uh, Mr. Saran. We actually have Indian researchers working at our research labs in Amsterdam, and we've got you know, other nationalities and research labs in India. Um, I think, indeed, there's a few practical things that, that, that uh, policymakers can do, and I think uh, Geraldine mentioned something that is very important. What Brazil has done, it has made the cars that drive around there flexible, so to take either the ethanol or the gasoline, and it costs about, correct me if I'm wrong, 300 to 400 euros or 500 dollars per car to do that. If that were to happen either in Europe or indeed in India and China, then industry will be able to see whether ethanol, uh, either pure or as a mix, will be available and can actually supply, because otherwise we're trapped in the chicken and egg trap, you know, we don't offer it because the cars can't take it and the people don't buy the cars because they can't buy the fuel. So those are simple things that governments can do to set there. In general, I think it's good if government can set their targets in fulfillment of high-level objectives. So say, what do you want? Say, less CO2, but don't take technological winners. Leave it up to the private sector to come up with the best way to achieve it. And I have to commend the European Commission on... Uh, the uh, uh, ETS system, because that is a very good system that simply says through cap and trade, this is what you need to achieve, and it actually achieves the objectives, but in a cost-efficient way. And uh, forgive me for saying I uh, said earlier, facts, maps, and figures are important. Uh, Fred Singer said that CCS costs 100% more energy, it's only 20%. We've been doing it for 20 years through enhanced oil recovery, enhanced gas recovery. The mantle of the earth is full with carbon building blocks, including CO2, and it's been there for millions of years. LNG is a virtual pipeline that brings flexibility that's badly needed in the system. Hydrogen, I agree, but it depends a little bit on what happens with batteries, but let's keep the facts right. Thanks. Uh, I'd really like to have some comments and, uh, uh, and questions from the floor. We have a speaker here, please, and then another one there later. Do we have a microphone? We do. Marvellous. You could say where you... Thank you, Tomasz Green from Josef Stefan Institute, Slovenia. I am not a climate uh, scientist, but I will ask uh, as an average citizen. Um, I read some papers also, uh, and I have these questions. Uh, it is known that uh, water vapor is, uh, absorbs 95% of heat. So we are all gathering about carbon dioxide, but water vapor is managed, uh, the absorption. That's one question. Um, the second is thousands of people are gathering about carbon dioxide in the world, but the world is uh, four-fifths are seas. And it is known that uh, water, that means also seas, are absorbing and releasing carbon dioxide in huge, huge, huge quantities. So man-made carbon dioxide is a minority in this uh, events. How could one understand that? Who would like to come back on that, those questions? Dr. Singer, I'm sure you well, let's, let's, let's hear from... Uh, okay. Uh, I think your, um, your <coughs> question really regarding the ocean absorbing CO2 
also discovered recently that the ocean could not take any more as it used to. We already, this is, this, this is one resource of storage which we're going to exhaust. And therefore, we got to think more serious about the issues. Now, this is ridiculous. CO2 does not cause climate change. I think now um, even the madman, the, the person who has no brain, is, is realized CO2 is causing the cl climate change and global warming. And then we got, we got to realize this. And therefore, any nonsense, a person come in and speak and say, this doesn't happen, this is not right, he's entitled to his opinion. But I think this is ridiculous. This is absolutely out of question because 99% of the people believe this happening. The issue now, how do we reduce it? How do we make it take longer for us to live in this earth rather than just perish ourselves if we find another planet to take us or reach it? That is the issue. But let me talk about it quickly regarding the renewable, just, just, just briefly. Remember, each megawatts of renewable enough for 3,000 homes to supply electricity for 3,000 homes. Now we have millions of megawatts operated by renewable energy, and it's going to be double and triple for the next 10 years. This is a solution we should invest in. Thank you. Dr. Singer, um, to come back very quickly, and then we'll take the other question, then we need to well, um, the gentleman is, is partly right. The ocean does control uh, the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, absorbs about half the carbon dioxide that's emitted by fossil fuel burning is absorbed by ocean and biosphere. And as the ocean gets warmer, it will absorb less of the CO2. That is correct. On the other hand, Water vapor is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, and uh, the models don't take it into account very well. And that's probably the reason why the climate models overestimate the effect of greenhouse gases, and why the observations do not show what the models predict. Because the models don't know how to handle water vapor properly, how to handle clouds. They are really very, very crude, and should not be relied on to make any predictions. I just want to add something about climate models. The models that are in use now are being tested about past climate. That's the way to validate a model, and models are validated in, or, in the way they can simulate weather patterns that have already occurred. And they are quite good at that. that that's why they are used for predic prediction. I would also like to add about uh, carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide will or would eventually be absorbed in the oceans, but the residence time in the atmosphere can be several hundred years. And that's why it, it, it is able to disturb the radiative balance of the Earth in the meantime. Thank you. Sorry, thank you for your patience. Uh, my name is Dina Storos and I represent Greenpeace, so I would like to present an NGO uh, perspective a little bit. I could comment on basically on everything that was said today, but I will focus on only uh, two things. First is I'm interested because we have representatives of uh, uh, countries outside the EU and because the title of this forum is From Bali to Copenhagen, and because we know that Europe is uh, has set itself a role of uh, a leader on fighting climate change, and we see negotiations now whether we should reduce our emissions by 20% or 30%, and basically we are somehow putting uh, 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 a limit saying that 30% is okay for Europe if other countries set this target for themselves. And I would like to hear your opinion, whether you see that Europe is really uh, uh, taking up its lead and, and uh, um, presenting itself as a leader when it's saying 20% reduction, but if there is an international agreement, we will have 30%, or whether you would rather see that Europe says 30% right now, which is scientifically proven. And the second thing is for uh, Mr. Pontelis, who is going to Brussels today and mentioning biofuels and voting for the 10% target. 
I would just like to remind you that this target was set with two preconditions. One precondition is if the second generation uh, biofuels are available and whether we can apply sustain sustainability criteria. And you have mentioned uh, food increase prices. It is true that it's not completely blamed on, on uh, uh, biofuels for food increase, but just recently, a couple of months ago, The Guardian uh, has uh, a uh, uh, published the leaked report from uh, World Bank which said that biofuels are indirectly uh, responsible for uh, uh, food increase, but there are also other matters which have to be taken into account, like uh, indirect land use change, for example, uh, social criteria, and, and several other things. And when we were talking about renewables, we have to know that, for example, biomass as being bioenergy can be used much more efficiently in electricity production than, for example, in fuel production. And whether somebody has uh, uh, comments on that. And uh, just my last point, uh, Greenpeace has published an energy revolution scenario which says that basically the world can <laughs> deal without nuclear as first and phasing out coal. And uh, if anybody is willing to discuss this in more detail later, later then. Thank you very much. Um, would someone on the panel like to come back on the issue of whether the EU should be going for 30% now rather than 20 and 30 only if there's an international agreement? Well, uh, of course it would be better to say that we're going to have a, a stronger reduction, no? But as a matter of fact, Europe represents a small proportion of the CO2 emission in the world, and it's useless if we reduce our part, and at the same time, we don't push the others to do the same thing. Because we are putting a burden in our energy structures without having a, an overall result. And the atmosphere doesn't care where that CO2 comes from. The, the most important uh, thing we have to do, we Europeans, is to try to convince the rest of the world to follow the same reduction path that we are going to to do, because if we do it and the others don't do it, well, it's completely useless, completely useless. It's much more interesting for us to in induct the behaviors on the others than to extreme our own behavior. So 30% is good, it's better than 20%, but if we don't uh, succeed in making the other people to become Kyoto addicted, well, the the, the result of our policy will be completely useless in a, on a global scheme, which is the best way of doing that, saying that we will do 30% in any case or trying to do some incentive for the others. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry the question is answered. So we have one more here, and then I'm really good. I'm being told by the organizer I need to summarize so the, the gentleman in the glasses. And if you could keep your question as short as possible, and any panelists, please, likewise... Uh, my name is Jean Lamy, I'm uh, from the EU French Presidency. Um, my question is just related to the, the title of this panel, uh, from the way, from, to Cop from, from Bali to Copenhagen. Uh, because, and, and related to uh, energy technology roadmaps and what has, needs to be done internationally. Uh, in Copenhagen, what we need is a treaty, it's not a statement. It's not uh, uh, new guidelines. Uh, of course, we need ideas or even brilliant ideas, but we need a treaty with targets, benchmarks, process, uh, standards, incentives. And we need this treaty to be built, to, to be the result of an international negotiations between states, between nations, within the four building blocks of the uh, Bali roadmaps, on mitigation, on, uh, on, on uh, adaptation, on financing, and on technology, besides a, a spare wheel <laughs> uh, on forestry. And uh, so, uh, on, on carbon and intensity to improve carbon intensity on processes in motors and products and to reduce energy intensity. So there are two tracks which are uh, which have been uh, exposed uh, brilliantly by uh, Hans van der Loo. And uh, I, I think there are uh, very uh, uh, precise ideas on the way to transform 
these uh, ideas to reduce carbon intensities in processes in products and to reduce energy intensity of our economies and to, to transform it in a treaty. So for, for this, on, on, the, on the question of the energy technology uh, transfers, transfer of techno energy technologies, the Bali Roadmaps says it's very important to have something more uh, precise on energy technology transfer. But it does not mention any energy technology. We, we are not speaking, we, and it, it does not transform, it does not, it does not say low carbon emitting technology. So w th there are some other ideas on energy technology roadmaps, the one which have been developed by IEA, and uh, there are some other ideas about sectoral approach. So I would very much have your uh, uh, feeling, and especially uh, our distinguished representative from the Prime Minister of, of India on, on this uh, side of the negotiation on how to implementable, to transform the Bali roadmap or transfer of technology in an implementable uh, negotiation for energy technology transfers. Um, Mr. That was uh, directed to you, Mr. Saran, so if you could try and be brief in your answer. <laughs> uh, as, as I mentioned that, um, you know, the uh, Bali roadmap reaffirms uh, what we have in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. I do not agree that we have to come up with a new treaty because the treaty is already there. So it is not that we are abandoning the UNFCC or we are abandoning uh, the uh, Kyoto Protocol and we are trying to come up with a new framework. The framework is already there and the framework has been reaffirmed, as I said, in Bali. Yes, we have to find practical solutions to the four building blocks that you mentioned because we have to uh, try and deal with mitigation, we have tried to deal with adaptation and how to bring about mitigation and adaptation through adequate transfer of financial resources as well as of technology. Our point as developing countries is that technology transfer is something which cannot be linked to market mechanisms. There is a legal commitment on part of the developed countries to transfer appropriate technologies to developing countries. It does not say subject to market conditions or subject to a, a convenient uh, tariff regime or investment regime. There is no such link. So how do we bring that about? If, as I said, if the idea is that in order to deal with mitigation and adaptation, you have to have as wide a diffusion of various technologies. You need not make a choice between this or that technology. But whatever technologies can bring about mitigation, can help you in adaptation, those technologies, if once they are identified or once they are considered suitable, then there must be a suitable IPR regime to deal with that. And we believe we have given, uh, in fact, proposals for how this transfer can take place through a suitably adjusted IPR regime. After all, we have done something similar with uh, uh, AIDS uh, treatment. Uh, we have an IPR uh, uh, treaty, but we also have uh, derogations from that for certain global challenges. Mm -hmm. Why can't we do it with uh, this global challenge? Mm -hmm. Second, as far as the financing is concerned, of course, that is the key element. Who pays? Because unless you solve the problem of who pays, you cannot really get very far. And here, the UNFCC very clearly recognizes that countries which, number one, have historical responsibility, number two, have the capacity of greater burden sharing than developing countries must take the lead. And this is not ODA. This must be something which is additional stream of finance. It cannot be linked with, uh, with ODA. And this stream of finance must be governed through a multilateral process. The UNFCC itself provides for a financing mechanism within the multilateral process. But it is not being properly implemented. Now, once we have that kind of a transfer in a multilateral framework, then the financing problem can also be resolved. To which, by the way, again, as, uh, as I said, major developing countries are also ready to contribute. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we haven't got time for questions. I'm being, getting signals from the back about summing up. Um, I hope any of you who have outstanding questions will be able to take them up with some of the speakers. Um, in summing up, uh, what have we learned today? I think, um, I think we haven't got any easy answers to the question of how we achieve the climate change targets. 
There is no magic bullet solution that's quite clear on which technology is, which single technology is the best way forward. But, but I'm struck by the, uh, the, the broad consensus, the not complete unanimity, of course, Dr. Singer, being our notable exception, uh, on, the, uh, on the need and the urgency to do something uh, and the challenge uh, to move for the, low co- the, the, third industrial re- the, the next industrial revolution or the move to new carbon technologies. Um, those of you who follow the debate within the EU will know how difficult it is getting the 27 member states to agree uh, how to achieve these targets, and quite clearly getting a wider agreement with the international community at the end of next year will be even more difficult, uh, and the EU at least has signed up to certain targets. The implementation is, is, is the challenge. Um, I'm uh, very uh, curious and intrigued and stimulated by this, this idea of, a, of, an, of an IPR regime uh, be, because obviously, um, and the idea, how do you, through international negotiations, uh, agree on a system which is equitable? Uh, as uh, Mr. Saran has explained, in trade negotiations, it's a low in, you end up with the lowest common denominator. People give away as little as they think they, they need to in order to get an agreement. But for this, we really need a new spirit of... Uh, responsibility, global responsibility, I suppose, would be the way to put it. And we don't, frankly, have much experience of that, so uh, the challenges uh, are enormous. Um, The challenges are enormous uh, in economic terms, but as we heard from our Danish speaker, uh, you can move, you can achieve your CO2 reductions and energy efficiency targets, uh, uh, thanks maybe partly to high oil prices, um, and that it, it is economic uh, to, bring on, uh, to bring on stream new energy sources such as wind. Uh, solar is maybe not quite in the same uh, situation, uh, but, but certainly wind and biomass uh, offer very concrete way f- ways forward uh, and should be taken up on a wider scale. Um, a number of speakers stressed the importance of the kind of secret technology, if you like, or the, the technology that's least talked about, which is simply energy efficiency. Uh, energy efficiency, I think, comes from uh, changes in behaviour, uh, sort of uh, an awareness about the uh, about the, the impact of the consumption, high energy consumption. But I, I, I think energy uh, efficiency as well requires enormous uh, amounts of investment in new building technologies, uh, in new transport networks and infrastructures. Um, and I, I don't think um, we've had a very uh, clear answer on where we find the money to do these things uh, from. Um, and one thing that always strikes me in this debate is that uh, the energy mix uh, for every country remains a sovereign choice. Uh, so some people will pursue nuclear, some people will pursue uh, renewables, but the one thing that you won't be able to force anybody to do is adopt some kind of universal solution, uh, and that's clearly uh, the way forward. Um, I hope you accept that as a reasonable summary. Uh, I'd like to thank very much our panellists who have given some excellent uh, uh, presentations on the issue uh, and very much uh, to all of you for attending this morning. Um, There are a couple of um, formal things. Uh, You may think you would never see food or liquid refreshment again. Uh, I'm pleased to inform you that you are invited to lunch in the hotel at 12.15 uh, by, the, uh, by uh, the Slovenian government and the Minister of the Economy, Mr. Vizjak, will be holding a keynote address. Uh, on a point of organisation for this afternoon, there is the possibility of, tour, uh, of a guided tour around Bled. I understand you need to contact the Bled tourist desk. Uh, there is also a se- uh, uh, an additional debate um, uh, on ecologically conscious businesses, the way of the future, between 2 and 3.30, and then there are two further panels this afternoon at 4 p.m. So thank you all very, very much, and see you later.